In May of 2011, Microsoft announced that they would be buying Skype for $8.5 billion in cash. From the very beginning, it seemed like Microsoft had overpaid for Skype. Just two years before this, Skype had been sold for a third of this price, coming in at $2.75 billion. There was no way that Skype's value had tripled within these 24 months, especially given the 2008 financial recession. Microsoft very much knew this, but if they wanted to get Skype, this was the price they had to pay because two other giants, Google and Facebook, were also interested in acquiring Skype. It appears that Microsoft had won the bidding wars, but now it was time for the actual hard stuff. They needed to ensure that this overpriced purchase would actually be worth it over the long term. Unfortunately, by all accounts, they would miserably fail at doing this. Public distaste for Skype simply grew year after year, and people were simply waiting for a viable alternative to pop up. For gamers, this turned out to be Discord. For everyday people, this turned out to be FaceTime and WhatsApp. And for schools and institutions, this turned out to be Zoom. Things actually got so bad that Microsoft themselves shut down Skype for business in the middle of 2021. Hearing all this, you would think that Skype was a massive failure. And technically, Skype itself was indeed a failure. But what if I told you that Skype as an investment was actually a massive win for Microsoft? You see, just as Skype started hitting its breaking point in the late 2010s, Microsoft went out and iterated on Skype themselves and created a new solution, Microsoft Teams. If you're a tech worker, you're probably extremely familiar with Microsoft Teams, and this sound probably gives you nightmares. If you're not familiar with Teams, this is basically the business equivalent of this sound. Anyway, according to Microsoft themselves, Teams is their fastest growing business app of all time. And let's not forget, Microsoft is also the creators of Office and Outlook, so this is truly an achievement. Between March and June of 2020, Teams actually grew faster than Zoom, growing a whopping 894%. And today, Teams has a total of 270 million users, which is not that far behind Zoom's 300 million users. Not to mention, Teams users are way more profitable given that they're more likely to be business users. In 2020, for example, Zoom pulled in just over $4 billion, while Teams actually pulled in nearly $7 billion. Yet, all the media ever talks about is Zoom. So, here's the rise and fall of Skype and its insane resurrection as Teams. Taking a look back, the story of Skype dates back to 2003, to two Scandinavian men named Nicholas Zenstrom and Janice Fries. The idea was to substantially reduce the cost of long-distance phone calls. If you have family in other countries, you're probably well aware of just how expensive this is, and this is still the case to this day. But nowadays, your first instinct wouldn't be to hop on Skype, it would probably be to use FaceTime or WhatsApp. Back in the early 2000s though, these options didn't even exist. So, you either had to pay AT&T an arm and a leg, or you had to put up with MSN Messenger. Skype's founders were acutely aware of this situation, and they felt that the industry was just asking for disruption. So, like any good entrepreneurs, they got to work. They would partner with some Estonian developers, and they would create a minimal viable product by the end of the year. And they would call it Skype, which stands for Sky Peer to Peer. Skype was a massive hit almost instantaneously. There was clearly a bunch of cooped up demand that was just waiting for a better solution, and Skype was exactly that. The founders built on the success by expanding into traditional phone calls as well, with the launch of Skype Out. Skype Out allowed users to directly call a landline or mobile phone from their computers. This probably doesn't sound like a big deal today, but back in 2005, this was insane because not everyone even had computers. This meant that you could leverage Skype even if only one person had access to a computer, and the best part was that it costed a mere two cents per minute. For perspective, if you don't have an international plan, AT&T will shamelessly charge you $2.71 per minute, and that's in 2022. Who knows how much AT&T charged in 2005? Anyway, the cost and convenience of Skype made it a no-brainer. Within 18 months of launching, Skype would cross 23 million registered users, and within two years, they would cross 100 million downloads. Skype was still very much just a startup, 
but bigger corporations were already interested in acquiring the business. And we weren't talking about tens of millions or even hundreds of millions. We were talking about billions. 2.6 billion from eBay to be exact. Skype had gone from zero to 2.6 billion in a matter of two and a half years. Not a bad day's work, but Skype was still just getting started. At the end of 2005, Skype would launch video calling and in mid-2006, they would launch support for massive calls with up to 100 people. By the end of 2007, Skype would reach 220 million registered users and by all accounts, they were crushing it. But despite all this growth, eBay was finding it more and more difficult to keep up with Skype. There was virtually no synergy between the two companies, so it was basically like running two different businesses. Soon enough, eBay just wanted out, so they would sell Skype to the first buyer they could find for a terrible valuation of $2.75 billion. These buyers would simply turn around and flip Skype to Microsoft a few years later for $8.6 billion in cold hard cash. And that brings us into the Microsoft era. Microsoft bought the top. That's simply the truth, and there's no way around it. To make things worse, not only did they buy the top, but they overpaid at the top due to the bidding war. But wait a minute, hold up, what happened? Wasn't Skype growing at an insane pace with no end in sight? Well, unfortunately, the reality was that there was an end in sight, and the reasoning was obvious. The number one selling factor of Skype was its functionality. People didn't use it because it had a cool UI or great integration and synergy or any of that. People used it simply because it solved a problem. But as we moved into the 2010s, there were several services that could solve the same problem. But these other services also came with a bunch of extra bells and whistles. WhatsApp, for example, actually offered an enjoyable mobile experience, unlike Skype. Meanwhile, Google Hangouts and Apple FaceTime were able to tap into the massive networks of Gmail and iPhone users. And for most people, switching to these services was a no-brainer. Why settle for just functionality when you could offer functionality and a great user experience? This isn't to say that Skype stopped growing per se. In fact, in terms of pure numbers, they continued their exponential growth into the billions of users. The problem though was that these weren't happy users. These were users that were becoming increasingly frustrated and the only reason they used Skype was because everyone around them was using it. It was popular because it was already popular. Likely the two biggest complaints about Skype were that the UI sucked and the service itself was not as reliable as competitors. The first point is not that surprising. I mean, we're talking about Microsoft here. Despite their enormous size, they've never been able to get mobile right. I mean, just think about the Windows phone which lost them $8 billion. The problem was that Microsoft was always trying to import a computer-based experience onto a mobile device, which simply didn't translate well. Meanwhile, their competitors were reimagining how every task could be done on a phone from scratch, and the competitors destroyed Microsoft every time. As for the reliability problem, this wasn't exactly Microsoft's fault, but they weren't able to fix it either. The reason that Skype was so unreliable was because it was a peer-to-peer -peer service. The reliability of a peer-to-peer -peer connection was simply uncomparable to a server-based connection backed by a $13 billion data center. Microsoft tried to address this by moving Skype to the cloud, but this move was always kind of botched. Not to mention, this move also kind of backfired as it made people think that Microsoft was trying to track your data. And if you were going to let Microsoft collect your data, you might as well let Google and Facebook collect your data. At least you'll have a good UI there. If you want some quantitative data regarding just how much people hated Skype, well, in June of 2017, the average App Store rating for Skype dropped from 3.5 stars to 1.5 stars. Yeah, it was that bad. But at the same time, no one cared enough to switch either, until the pandemic. People figured that if they were going to use video conferencing on a regular basis, they had to find a better solution, and the answer was Zoom. And this pretty much sealed the fate of Skype. During all of this, Microsoft was by no means oblivious to what was happening. They were literally waiting to get destroyed in the consumer market. But at the same time, Microsoft oddly didn't mind. You see, the entire company was moving away from consumer products. 
I mean, they've literally made Windows and Office free for consumers. The reason for this is that Microsoft is no longer a consumer business. The majority of the revenue actually comes from B2B revenue for things like cloud infrastructure, servers, databases, and licensing. With that being said, Skype no longer fit inside their wheelhouse. Something that did fit though was business video conferencing. Microsoft already had strong relationships with virtually every company in the world, given that basically every company has to license Windows, Office, and Outlook. So why not sell them another solution that seamlessly integrates with these products? And this led to the launch of Skype for Business in 2015. Microsoft quickly realized though that the Skype branding wasn't doing them any favors. So they would embark on a complete rebranding, which led to the launch of Microsoft Teams in 2017. It wasn't all sunshines and rainbows though, as most businesses already had established video conferencing systems from Cisco. Cisco WebEx was nothing to brag about, but it got the job done and the companies didn't see a reason to switch. As a result, adoption of Teams was lackluster to say the least. By the end of 2017, Teams only had 2 million users, and even by the end of 2018, Teams only had 8 million users. 2019 was a much better year for Teams as they finally got into the tens of millions of users. But the breakthrough obviously didn't come till 2020. As we all know, 2020 forced everyone to reevaluate their video conferencing solutions, and the choice was pretty clear. WebEx was an obvious no. If you're not familiar with WebEx, it's basically the business equivalent of Skype. This left companies with two options, Zoom or Teams. Both products offered leading conferencing solutions, but Teams had a slight leg up on Zoom, which was integration with Microsoft's other products. For companies that already relied on Microsoft products, this synergy was simply too good to pass on, and I think you can guess what happened next. Today, Teams doesn't receive all that much attention, just like Microsoft themselves. But don't let this fool you, Teams is the real king of video conferencing. For most people, using Zoom was an unfortunate temporary reality, and they ditched Zoom as soon as they could. This is very much reflected in Zoom's stock graph. For most companies, however, using Teams is a permanent solution. And given that companies are pretty hesitant on switching services, they're probably locked in for several years, if not decades. So Microsoft's $8.5 billion acquisition has turned into $6.8 billion in revenue every single year. And that was as of 2020 when Teams had 75 million users. Since then, their user count has grown nearly fourfold to 270 million. So Teams revenue today is definitely above $10 billion and probably closer to $20 billion. And if you're still not convinced about Teams success, just listen to this. Last quarter, Microsoft made $5.3 billion from Windows, their most well-known product. If we annualize this, we get about $21.2 billion per year. In other words, Teams revenue is literally comparable to that of Windows. And it's probably just a matter of time until Teams overtakes Windows altogether. We should also note that the sector that Teams is part of is already at $11.5 billion per quarter, which is twice of Windows. So who knows? Maybe Teams has already overtaken Windows. And that's why Skype was likely Microsoft's best acquisition of all time. Skype itself didn't work out all that well, but it gave rise to the behemoth that is Teams. Did you hate Skype? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you would like to see more business case studies. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari. And I'll see you guys on the next one.